Claire Carmichael. I'm a newly qualified general practice nurse and I'm here today to tell you what to expect if you want to go into general practice nursing. So first things first, I'm just going to quickly do a brief overview of every single thing, or well not everything, this list is not limited to by no means at all, um, but I'm just going to go through a quick list of things that you would do in your role as a general practice nurse, just so you can get an overview firstly if you don't know that sort of thing, just so you can sort of see the, the amount of variation in GP nursing. And for this one... I'm going back to basics. I'm actually getting a part script for this <laughs> because there's so much stuff that a GP nurse does. I physically just, I don't want to miss anything on this vlog. Other clinics might be different because GP clinics uh, do their own thing in a way. So one GP might do minor injuries and um, minor surgery and that sort of thing. Whereas other ones might not do that sort of thing. So yes, this, lim this list is not limited to, and it might change between practices, disclaimer. First of all, okay, are you ready? So you will do hypertension clinics, diabetic clinics, asthma clinics, travel vaccines, flu vaccines, baby vaccines, ECGs, minor surgery, like I said, setting up and assisting the doctor with things like toenail removals or wart removals, um, new patient health checks, blood tests and results, mental health assessments, home visits, smear testing slash cytology, um, sexual health and contraception, wound management, um, leg ulcer dressings, compression management, things like that. A lot of health promotion and health prevention, communicating as well with your team, so the mental health services, your doctors, your receptionists, pharmacists, phlebotomists, paramedics. There's all this like really good integrated team now in GP land calling patients as well to book in their appointments and follow-ups, telephone consultations, doing false preventions and assessments and frailty assessments as well, things like that on patients because you want to protect those patients and also safeguarding, safeguarding as well. So anything you see that you think, oh, you have to refer on to your safeguarding leads. That's quite big as well, especially if you're doing like things like baby IMS or dealing with someone with dementia or learning disabilities, you have to be really mindful of these sort of things in the background. And you will also see a whole range of patients so you'll see from pr a pregnant lady to newborn baby all the way to the baby growing up all the way to teens all the way to adulthood all the way to elderly and, and end of life or palliative care as well you'll see a whole range of things and it's just amazing so now I spoke about all the weird and wonderful things and amazing variety that a GP nurse does. I just want to talk about, OK, so what is expected of you as a nurse? Because there is a lot there. How are you going to learn all of that? What's expected as a newly qualified nurse as well going into that sort of thing? How are you going to get to know how to do everything, if that makes sense? So I'm just going to run through some little things for you. So as a new general practice nurse, whether it's newly qualified or whether you've come from the hospital, acute sort of sector into general practice, you will have your induction when you go in. And this can vary from place to place and person to person. Like for me, because I'd had a general practice placement, I knew the EMIS system already that we were working with. And there was a lot of things that I could do already. So I felt a lot more comfortable and confident to start my own clinic sooner. Whereas you might not have that. You might need a lot more shadowing, a lot more training and stuff like that. So it's, firstly, it's about being open and honest and being comfortable and confident and competent in what you're doing. Make sure you speak up if you're not confident to do something and make sure you get that extra training if you need it. That's the most important thing going into general practice because at the end of the day, this is patients' lives, patient safety, and that's got to be at the forefront of your mind as well. So yeah, so just take it easy step by step and get that training to start off. So the bits of training you'll have to start with is um, you'll have your normal induction, fire safety, health and safety, information governance, all those little things. You might get someone watching you if you're already doing bloods. For example, I already did bloods in sexual health. So they just wanted me to just do a little refresher and do a competency thing, sign off. So I sat with the nurse and I did all the bloods and she signed me off to say I was competent to do that. So just little things that you can do will have to go off on a competency list as well. Also for this, there's the amazing Queen's Nursing Institute or QNI for short their website I'll put the link below they've got an amazing general practice template it's just fantastic so have a look at that website there is a whole induction template specifically for GP which is what I printed off and I've gone by so it's really really good really helpful so just make sure you follow that as well and have a look at it 
Next, you will, if you haven't got those skills already, so if you can't do baby immunizations, I can't do baby immunizations. I never got trained that at university, so that's a, a separate course I have to do. Also smear tests, I have the separate training for that. So anyway, there's a separate course called the Fundamentals of Primary Care course, and you go to uni like one or two days here and there just to learn those skills, and then you take it back to your practice and then you implement them all. So um, I start my primary primary care course in September. I'm so excited. It was put off. It was due the start of the year, but unfortunately COVID and the pandemic hit. So it has been put off to September and it is actually part of it is online as well, which it's a bit sad, but it's okay. I know the reasons why. So yes, anyway, I've, I've got my template for my course. So I know what I'll be learning, what I'm doing. So I'm just going to run through that really quickly with you. So you can sort of see what you're doing on your primary care course when that time comes for you as well. So this is my timetable that I've printed off. Mine is through the Portsmouth campus. So this is where I'm doing all of mine. Other campuses and other areas might be different. They might edit it and tweak it slightly and you might be on a slightly different structure, if that makes sense. But these are the things I'm doing. So 23rd of September is my course overview, inductions and all of that. Then I'm on the 6th, 7th, 20th and 21st of October, so four days in October. I've got the history of general practice and clinical governance in primary care. I've got infection control, portfolio assessment and overview. And then I've go straight into cervical screening for the, the final two days in October. And then November the 10th, 11th, 24th and 25th, four days again. I've got immunizations, immunizations again for two days. I've got wound care and leg ulcers for a day. And then I've got portfolio, portfolio reviews and individual tutorials on one day. And then we're going to December. So December the 8th and 9th, I have consultation and communicating with patients, impact of long-term conditions and ear care. Yes. And then we're going to January. I know January the 12th, 13th, 26th and 27th. So we've got a group seminar and introduction to SA. Didn't expect to write an essay on this, I'm not going to lie. Um, that's level six and then level seven introduction essay again. And then we have a reading day on the 13th. Yay! I'm assuming I'm going to knock out this essay in that day, maybe. And then on the 26th of January, we've got the skills lab for venipuncture, which is the blood testing and interpreting the results, which I can't wait to do that side of it because at the minute I'm sort of learning online and trying to work out what's what. And even though I can take blood, it's the results bit that, yeah, gets me sometimes. And then we've got sexual health. And then February the 9th, 10th, 23rd and 24th, we've got integra integrated care. We've got another introduction to the SA bit as well, part B apparently. Health promotion, cardiovascular disease and ECGs, common mental health presentations. Yes, yes, yes. We need this in GP because we see so much of it. It's unreal. Even on the wards, if you're in the acute sector, you see a lot of mental health issues. Um, so it's, I'm so glad that that's in there. Um, dementia, child and adult safeguarding, which I've done a bit um, of that anyway. Diabetes. Oh, that's March. Sorry, going into March. 9th and 10th, 23rd and 24th of March, we've got diabetes, asthma and COPD, accountability, managing HCAs. I don't like the word managing HCAs. That sounds like I'm going to be like, <laughs> no, maybe um, collaboration with HCAs would be a nice one. OK, individual tutorials again, assignment surgery. No idea. And then another reading day in April the 20th and then April the 21st is our last day. So it's a re review of the course, evaluation and wash up. I hope they don't mean washing your hands because that should be at the start. <laughs> but yeah, so that is the overall of your course. So you're going to get all of those extra skills that you need to become a GP nurse and the rest you you're going to be learning on the job with the other nurses as well. So yeah just sitting in and listening to other people's consultations as well you might get a chance to sit in with the doctors as well if you've got any extended people like the phlebotomist might come to your surgery i know a surgery that i did my placement on and um, they didn't really do the bloods as much they had their own dedicated phlebotomist that came in and did all that so that was actually really useful it took sort of the pressure i think off of the nurse as well 
So yeah, but we have amazing HCAs where I'm working now. We've got two that do all of, mainly of the blood testing. Uh, and one of them actually is taking on a lot more now. So she's doing a lot more wounds and leg ulcers and compression. She's doing amazing. She can do some things that I can't even do yet. It's hilarious. I love it. The HCAs are amazing. They're such a benefit to any setting anyway. Your hours as a GP nurse. So your hours might vary from place to place because again, everywhere's different. It's really hard to pinpoint these things down in GP because everyone does something different clinic to clinic. It's a little bit frustrating in that way, but find the right clinic for you that's going to give you the best career development and choices and flexibility. A lot of them are very flexible because they are based around like family centered and they're really, really nice like that. It is a nice community actually in GP land. But anyway, the hours that I do, so I do four days a week. I used to do five days a week. So I used to do three long days and two short days. But then I, f I felt because it's quite a drive where I'm, I'm at, it's like 22 miles from my house. So I, I spoke to the management teams and I cut mine down into four days. So now I do four long days, half eight to half six. And I have Thursdays and weekends off, which is amazing. It's so nice. It's so much better to do it this way. Best thing to do is if you're looking at GP and look at their website and see what hours they're open, because that will give you a rough idea to what hours you might be doing so what realistically to expect like in your practice as you're working there's two sides to this story so one side as a practice nurse I feel wow like so overwhelmed some days because I'm so busy I've got so much to do I've got so much to remember I've got so much to document and you've only got a short space of time between each patient to do everything in so you do feel very busy very like oh my god oh my god oh my god however you do get into a nice flow and a nice routine unless something goes wrong <laughs> if something goes wrong then all your patients are going to be waiting in the waiting room but that's okay it's again it's about communication as well with your patients so if you're running behind if something's happened get reception or go out yourself and just say I'm really sorry something's happened there is a bit of a delay I'm really sorry and you know what that's the main thing I've found with patients they just want to know what's going on they want to know why they're sat there for 20 minutes waiting for their nurse when their appointment was 20 minutes ago and they haven't seen anyone coming out your room so they think that you're just sat there it's really really important to just be open and honest with your patients and communicate with them because that's where it sort of starts going wrong that's when patients start to complain to a reception that's when they write complaints and referrals and all sorts goes on so yeah so just be mindful of that so then you have the positive next side it's so rewarding it's such an amazing career and you will go home thinking Do you know what yes I did the best for my patients today I really helped that patient today I prevented a stroke I prevented a heart attack I prevented sepsis I've really helped this person in their mental health crisis and they've gone out of here smiling instead of crying when they come in you're gonna feel this over just this amazing overwhelming sense of wow what have I done today? This is amazing. And it's those days that just make all of the difference. And you just think, yes, this is why I've come into this role. But at the same time, it is hard work. You really have to be dedicated to this role. You have to be confident in your abilities. You have to be open and honest. You have to speak to your colleagues and always seek help if you need it. If you need backup, then you need to call people in and your team will always support you. You just need to ask for the help. But above all, it is amazing. So I've spoke about expectations in your practice and I briefly spoke about patients getting a little bit miffed. So this is expectations. What's what it's really like dealing with the public and again it's such a variety um some patients are really lovely really understanding they'll be just they won't want to bother you at all but actually they really need it so i've had patients with things happen to them and I'm just sat there like why haven't you told me this why haven't you said this and they're like oh I didn't want to bother you I was like but you need to bother me because you could be having a heart attack you could be having um, a stroke you could be having DVTs whatever's gone on in that person's life these are the people that never say anything and then you've got other patients who want everything and beyond and they can't understand why you can't do it for them because you're a nurse you should know this or you should do this and you're just like I literally can only do so much <laughs> and nothing you do will be enough for the odd person. I have to say the odd person because that's not realistically everybody, that it's just one or two people and that's just the way they are, that's their, them as a person, that's what they're expecting, they've got high expectations of nurses and doctors, maybe they haven't been treated well in the past by healthcare professions so they've got this 
different side to things so you just have to be mindful that that person might be going through a lot they might be going through things that you don't know about so it's about respecting them even though they're not very nice sometimes it's about respecting them being your your best self for that person and still treating them as a person however if someone is getting physically aggressive or verbally aggressive no don't stand for that because I think as nurses, we think, oh, we have to treat everybody and, you know, but if someone's coming at you, attacking you verbally, no, that's not okay. And if you let them get away with that behaviour, they're going to be like that time and time again, and they're going to keep doing it. So you need to just obviously professionally and politely and just say, do you know what? This isn't acceptable. I'm here to help you. I'm not here to get verbally abused or whatever. Continue this. You'll be out and off the books so it's your choice no one in healthcare should ever be verbally or physically abused luckily it's been okay at our place it's been all right but yes it's just it's just more of a, a reminder to people just you don't have to put up with that just make sure you give them a professional little warning and a gentle stop that <laughs> so just as a final overall round thing what to expect as a gp nurse overall do you know what it's a very different setting to the acute setting you will notice the change like that like in an instant you'll be like whoa this is like a whole different culture this is a whole different breed of nurses this is a whole different breed of management and overall i think this is just my own personal opinion from when i was on my placement to this placement to other gp nurses that i speak to overall it's an amazing place to be and the, the way things are managed are, are so much better and the way that people communicate with each other is so much better and gp nurses are, are so much better like everything just is so much better for me however that might not be for you so it's about finding what you really want as well in life if if gp is not for you then that's okay find your speciality because as long as you're happy, that's all that matters. GP, for me and many, many nurses, it's amazing and it's a long, fulfilling career ahead of you. So yeah, good luck, guys.